super honored to be speaking with our guest today on the Train Right podcast. She's known by many as the Queen of Pain and for her many accomplishments on and off her mountain bike. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Rebecca Rush. Hi, Rebecca. How are you doing today? Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so glad to be speaking with you. Um, so tell us really quickly, where are you based right now? I'm at home in Ketchum, Idaho, and been here for a little while, enjoying. It's snowing some days, sunny some days, so spring mountain weather. Um, so I'm starting to be able to get out on my bike a little bit. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so today, basically, I think um, all of us, I mean, there's an immense amount that we can learn from you, and I think through just endurance sports in general, but I was hoping that kind of the theme for today um, that we're going to be kind of talking around um, is this whole idea of finding comfort in discomfort. And I feel like that is something that I have to kind of come to terms with almost every time I go out for a long run or, um, I mean, I'm into gravel bike riding now too, (laughs) so for a long bike ride, but um, before we get into kind of your your many accomplishments and what you're doing now, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background and how you got into ultra endurance cycling? Absolutely. I'm kind of like a cat with nine lives. I've done a lot of different sports, um, but my my introduction to sports started in in high school with cross country running, and I really fell in love with running through the forest and you know kind of. Um, having different courses and and being able to be outside. And that was really the start of my athletic career. And since then, you know, it's been an evolution from rock climbing and adventure racing, which is multi-sport endurance events. Uh, Let's see, paddling. And I guess the most recent iteration is, is mountain biking. And you know, even though I've done a lot of different sports, I also cross country ski and backcountry ski you know, it may seem like it's all over the place, but the common theme really has been endurance in all of those. And I, I learned pretty early on in high school, you know, on the cross country team, you had to also run track. And I, I learned pretty early on that the longer the distance was, the, the better I was at it physically, but also the more I enjoyed the kind of sense of exploration. So even though I've done a lot of different things, they've always had this endurance focus and kind of this sense of, of wanting to see what's around the next corner or over the next hill. Yeah. And I mean, I love that, like non-traditional kind of sports backgrounds. I mean, it's how I got into ultra endurance running. I was a tennis player. Um, and then I kind of dabbled in every single sport. And then I found out that the longer kind of the matches went, the better, the better I felt. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's funny because as a runner cur- turning over like uh, into – to cycling. I mean, I found cycling through injury. Um, it was hard for me to make a transition. Was it, did, was it hard for you to kind of, as a, like who started out as a runner, like, was it hard for you to kind of hop on the bike eventually, or did that take a while? Um, it took a while. I didn't really start focusing on mountain biking exclusively until age 38. And so I was quite a late bloomer in that. So I had years of, you know, living out of a truck, being a dirt bag climber, Um, you know, doing traveling around and doing these adventure races, which were like eco challenge. And so though, you know, I had a pretty diverse background before I got into mountain biking. Um, and really I, my worst sport was mountain biking. I was terrible at it. And so it it is kind of, um, it's kind of interesting people who knew me before mountain biking, they can't believe that I actually became a cyclist (laughs) because I really was so bad. And, uh, yeah, not very good at it, but it served a purpose of, like I said, wanting to explore. And the bike is such a great vehicle for being able to see more. And, you know, I still yeah. love running. I still run. I paddle. But really, you know, being on wheels just opened up this whole backyard where I live and the rest of the world and places that I could go see and and cover more distance. Yeah, I mean... I can, I can definitely relate to that. I mean, when I first started like gravel bike riding, I mean, I it was like, oh my gosh, like any rock, I would, like I did not, did not think that I'd be able to like do a race like Dirty Cancer or something like this. But um, no, I mean, I love that. And be- before you got into kind of just ultra, ultra endurance cycling, I love this idea of like the multi-sport. I mean, I follow a couple of friends of mine who do adventure racing and I think that that's such a good way to explore and you did rock climbing before that. Um, Can you kind of tell me like how, 
how you decided to pursue this and like basically this was kind of your first step into becoming a professional athlete. Um, you started with like, you know, you're traveling with the team, you were racing with the team. Um, can you kind of tell me about, about that? Like, were there any obstacles along the way with kind of choosing to prioritize a life of sport versus like a traditional lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) that's a great question. And I never set out to say, you know, I'm going to become a professional athlete or, you know, I'm going to try to go to the Olympics or, or any of this stuff. Um, I, I, I really, one, didn't have a lot of confidence in myself as an athlete and didn't think I was anything special. Um, and at the time that I got involved with adventure racing, I was managing and part owner of rock, some rock climbing gyms in California. And for me, that was a dream job of, of being a climber, um, and also having a business marketing degree. And really I, I thought, you know, I'm set, this is it. And, uh, I started getting some weird invitations just when adventure racing was coming, um, kind of in the forefront, this was in the nineties, I started getting invited to, I got invited to do this race that I didn't know what it was about. Um, it was a 24 hour adventure race and (laughs) I didn't know what it was. You know, these people kind of explained it to me. I'm like, that sounds terrible doing that for 24 hours. But I got talked into it mostly because I was female and I was a climber and paddler and runner. And, you know, I sort of checked three of the like six boxes of the sports that you needed to do. And the teams were made up, you know, three or three men, one woman. And so really a lot of teams at that time, there weren't a lot of women doing, doing outdoor sports or definitely not as many as now. And so I sort of was a commodity of like, okay, let's grab this strong female and throw her into the team and see what happens. And, you know, that was my introduction to adventure racing. And we ended up, our team of sort of ragtag people ended up winning, um, the first race that we ever did. And it was a, it was a qualifier for eco challenge in Australia. And so, you know, honestly, how I got involved was just sort of saying yes to an opportunity and a challenge. And even when we won that trip to Australia to do the full eco challenge, I kind of thought, okay, this is a cool trip, you know, a free trip to Australia, Um, And then I'll be done with it. And I really did think that that was going to be kind of a one-off and I'd go back to climbing and my job um, at the climbing gym. Um, But that really did start to snowball. And really, like I said, I wasn't planning on becoming a professional athlete or doing that, but I just kept saying yes to these opportunities because I love to travel and explore and they kept popping up. So one race led to another, led to another. and, And soon enough, I was the team captain, I was managing the team, managing sponsorship. And that's when I decided, okay, if I wanted to take advantage of these travel opportunities and these sports opportunities, I need to quit my job and live out of my car because I can't afford to pay rent or, 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 you know, and I can't take that much time off work. So I really did kind of take a sabbatical and I, I packed up my Bronco. I left LA in a really, you know, really amazing job and went and lived out of my car for a number of years and kind of scraped through make, you know, working part-time jobs and going on these big adventures and going rock climbing. And so, yeah, there was a ton of risk in, you know, turning away um, a, a great job and stability um, and a paycheck to, kind of go adventuring. And, you know, for me, it was, I really did think it would be a short term thing, but, you know, here many decades later, that really was the start of me being able to uh, be a professional athlete and really um, hustle and make a business out of going exploring and adventuring and, and doing things in the outdoors. Yeah. See, I mean, I love that. I mean, I think a lot of really the start is I love that theme of just saying yes, saying yes to opportunities. And I mean, as an athlete, you obviously, you have to think about things. You have to plan, you have to, you know, prepare for these races and train, but there is kind of this jumping into the unknown, right? I and- Yeah. And I think I will say that I think a lot of us and women, especially, we want to wait until we're the most prepared, we're totally planned, we're totally ready, you know, to <laughs> to either do a race or do an event or go on a trip. And honestly, we're never ready. You know, you're never a hundred percent ready and, you know, training and focus and preparation obviously has to happen. But if you're like me, I never feel like I've done everything I could. I've never (laughs) entered a race or an event where I'm like, I'm a hundred percent ready. I've done everything I could. 
you know, it's kind of <laughs> like good enough is good enough and you do your best. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I love that because that's that's always that's always how I feel too. I'm like, okay, like I have to I have to prepare, I have to plan for this, but there's I mean, obviously in life you can't even predict tomorrow. So it's 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 like accepting this kind of discomfort. Um, but in it you also find comfort. At least at least I feel like I do. Um, was that was that your experience like in in these races? Like did you I mean, and also living out of your car. I mean, <laughs> Like, no, I mean, it is like, I've, I've done that before too. Like I literally couldn't afford to pay rent. So I packed up all my stuff, put it in storage. And then I tried to live off of basically these races would, you know, pay for my accommodation for three days and then try to figure it out. Um, but that's not always comfortable. Um, how did you kind of, how did you deal with that? It's not comfortable. And there, there was, and there still is a lot of sacrifice in my chosen career and my chosen adventures. Um, I, I think, you know, when I first was, was leaving California and, and, you know, kind of taking the risk of going and living in my car, you know, my motivation was that if I don't do this, will I look back and regret it later? And, you know, I have this opportunity right now in this moment, should I do it? You know, and I didn't have the responsibility of, of children or debt or anything like that. So I did have the freedom to say yes. So, you know, when I'm talking to people about taking risk or doing something, you know, I had a backup plan. It wasn't, it didn't seem that risky to me because I, like I said, I didn't owe money, you know, and I always felt like I could always go back and get another job and, and had a safety net. And so, I think it's important when you're considering those things that, that are going to be uncomfortable. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. It was really nerve wracking to not be able to afford health insurance or not know where the next paycheck was going to come from. But, um, you know, the absolutely like the rewards that have come from, you know, making that kind of sacrifice have been pretty amazing. I, there's, people ask me all the time, they're like, why do you torture yourself? Why do you do these long events? Like, why have you chosen basically the most difficult road that you could have chosen? And honestly, it's because um, I, I really feel like the trail and these adventures are my teacher. And I learn about myself and I learn about the world and what I'm capable of when I'm in the middle of these really hard, uncomfortable things. And it's it's really who comes out the other side that is is the addiction for me and and the evolution of of who I am on these trails and so i don't love pain or i don't want to be uncomfortable but i really do love how i grow from those experiences oh, i love how you put that it's like it's like putting me in the position of you know why i love to race and and why i mean love to train and 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 kind of put myself inevitably in, in these uncomfortable positions. It's like the end result where you kind of learn the most. And I mean, following up on, on those initial choices to kind of pursue, pursue a career in basically the unknown of kind of hopping from paycheck to paycheck or not knowing when, you know, okay, can I, you know, pay for food this month or pay for rent? Um, um, did you get any, did you get any criticism from, um, you know, your family or friends and then I guess like the follow up to that would be, but in that, were you able to kind of find trust in yourself? You know, I didn't get criticism from my family, which was pretty amazing. My mom has always yeah. been really supportive and she's like, you know what? You weren't asking for money. You weren't on drugs. You weren't, you know, doing anything bad. You were just kind of, you know, taking a walkabout and, and going and yeah. doing something that you loved. And so, you know, she was, she's always been supportive and, and same with my sister. Um, so I didn't have that kind of pressure of like, what are you doing with your life? Um, <laughs> I think they knew I was, I was enough of a free spirit that, that I had to go do this. And, yeah. you know, the alternative of me sitting in an office or a nine to five job, I think they knew me well enough to know that, that would have been, that wouldn't have been suitable for me, that I had to choose a, a little bit of a different path. And so they were supportive while I tried to figure it out and kind of like find my way. And, and I did really find a, a tribe of people that were adventurers, explorers, people that kind of had the same, the same sort of feeling that you and I do of like, 
let's go there. Let's try that. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. And then, I mean, like these big adventures too. I mean, I think it's like you can almost, yeah, maybe some things on pen and paper are uncertain, right? Like you maybe can't trust in kind of the black and white outcome of, of a race, but still I, I feel like in pursuing these hard events and these especially ultra endurance or just something that like really brings the best out of you you learn this you learn to trust yourself you learn to kind of know that when things kind of when you have to dig deep that you know you can rely on yourself in these really kind of tough situations um I immediately think to I mean I I have been following you for a while um but you this race that you did in Alaska um <laughs> Yeah. So basically, so the I did the I did a rod, right? So yeah. um, I first learned about this race, like literally when I was a little kid, like while ch- watching Balto, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like, wait, what? People can do this on a bike, like not with uh, dogs, right? Like not a dog sled race, um, you know, or self basically self propelled. Yeah. Um, but I was just, I mean, I was thinking of this, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like how how in the world, like it just, to be able to not only push yourself through and like, how long is the trail? It's, there's two, ver- the, the full trail is a thousand miles and I've done for the last two years, a 350 mile version. So the, the short version, um, but yeah, the full trail is a thousand miles. And I mean, I'll, I'm going to let you kind of obviously take it away so you can kind of explain what this was. But I mean, even just thinking about someone else doing it, the amount of kind of like fear that would go through my mind to, to put yourself basically, you know, you have to get yourself out of these tough situations. Like there's no one else that can, you know, can do it for you. You're like out there in the elements. Like that takes a huge level of trust, like in yourself to actually just get on the start line to one of these events. Um yeah, like how, I mean, I know this is like, you know, further on, you've done um, like a, an incredible amount of races up until this point, but I mean, it's still the same. I, I feel like how, what motivated you to, to do a race like this? And can you like describe kind of what that was like? Yeah. I mean, the Iditarod Trail Invitational, the human powered version of the Iditarod Trail um, is, it's actually something I said I would never do um, because I'm not <laughs> good in cold. I don't really enjoy cold. I was really scared by that environment. Um, so I didn't think my, my body would was, is suited for it, but my mind also wasn't suited for it or excited about it. And, Mm -hmm. and so for years I, you know, I had my, I no friends who've done it, but it was so far off my radar and it said, no way, no way. I don't want to go do it. Um, and I went last year for the first time really at the prompting of my friend, Jay Peterberry, who who's done it 13 times and won it multiple times. And once I started thinking about it, I started, like you said, I started getting really nervous. My hands would start sweating. You know, I started researching, um, cold weather equipment online and talking to mountaineering friends of mine and, and to Jay about survival in, in those kind of temperatures. And what I realized in my sort of excitement of, you know, fear and excitement are, are very close in uh, emotions. <laughs> and I started to realize that I hadn't done a really big expedition like that where I really was intimidated. I hadn't done that in quite a while. Um, because like you said, I've done a lot of expeditions. I'm confident in my abilities to navigate and complete long distance things, but I hadn't really scared myself and gotten outside my comfort zone for a number of years. And I realized I missed that and I needed it. And so I went to Iditarod last year. Um, and I finished, my only goal was to finish with all my fingers and toes and complete the course. (laughs) And I did that. And, you know, I was the first female to finish, you know, in a very small, only like 20 people finish. And this was even the short course. Um, but I was a mess. I, I only completed it because of my sort of grit and determination and endurance experience. But um, I didn't eat well. I didn't train properly for it. And literally, I was a crying, sobbing mess on the finish line. <laughs> um, physically and emotionally battered. And I really, I put myself at risk because you're right. Those elements are life or death and you make a mistake out on the Iditarod trail and, and, you know, it might be days before somebody can get there to help you. And so you really are 
your own safety net and your own first responder and, and you do have yeah. to be self-support and take care of yourself. And so I vowed after last year that I knew I wanted to come back. I fell in love with that adventure on that trail and the history and the dogs and like mm-hmm. how hard it is to, to like race out there and to survive out there. And I really became addicted to that and fell in love with it. And so I vowed to go back this year more prepared and that's where I got really serious with my coach and set up a training program, you know, did a lot of actually upper body strength and weights. I did a bunch of research on nutrition to make sure that I could eat and drink better. I made a bunch of my own food. And so, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and dialed in my equipment and practiced sleeping out overnight in the snow and Mm -hmm. in Idaho. And so I did the preparation and, and the result was, um, it was pretty awesome because this year's, I will tell you, so last year took me three and a half days to do 350 miles. Um, you do the math. It's, it's not very fast. Um, this year it took (laughs) seven days to go the same distance. And the reason was the, the mother nature really unleashed on the Iditarod trail this year. And the conditions were horrendous with snow almost every day. The trail was blown in or gone, like 50 mile an hour winds, minus 40 um, degree temperatures. And it was, it was insane and intense. And if those conditions had been there last year, I wouldn't have completed it. But because I'd done the preparation this year, you know, I, Cross the finish line this year, not a complete crying, you know, blubbering <laughs> mess and feeling really proud of myself. And, you know, even though people are like, it took you twice as long and you didn't win. It's like, I am so proud of my achievement this year versus last year because I did it well and I did it in style and I did it safely. And, you know, I was able to really survive in those elements and sleep out at night and, you know, melt snow to make water and ran out of food a bunch because it was longer than expected. But, but there, I do trust myself now in that kind of environment and that feeling of like strength and power and knowing if I prepare, I can do anything. Mm -hmm. And I haven't, you know, I'm 51. And so to experience that kind of, you know, the hardest expedition I've ever done in my life and feel really good about it at my age is super exciting for me because it just means there's more adventures to be had. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. I mean, it's, it's like that kind of stuff is what, what I live for. It's like, there's something, even though, you know, you you're a veteran, like you have so much experience in these long endurance races. It's like every single thing that you do, even if it's the same exact course, but a year later, it can be completely different. Right. And I feel like um, even all of those, like just I mean, going back to talking about your background and how you got into ultra endurance cycling, I mean, all of your little kind of all of the little pieces along the road, I feel like they kind of lined up and they've taught you something. And that is like what we discussed before, like trusting in yourself, learning, knowing that you can kind of, you know, problem solve and get through a tough situation, um, you know, obviously through preparation, but then also just like in the moment. And I don't know. I just think that that's really powerful. And obviously a race like the, the Iditarod race has definitely taught you that, but I feel like just in general races and even training rides can teach you the same. I, Um, yeah. I mean, we are all a work in progress and we're all evolving and, and who we are today is this, you know, this lovely sort of, uh, you know, mix of every experience we've had in our life. And so, you know, I do the, you know, people ask, why did you change sports so many times? Or even within cycling, why did you change from 24 hour racing to stage races to now ultra endurance, you know, self-support bike packing. And Mm -hmm. I think it's important for everybody to think about your evolution and what excites you in the moment and that you are a work in progress and you're building, you're continually building on your experience base for, for the next thing. And, you know, I'm asked all the time, when will you tire? When will you stop? And never, because, (laughs) you know, like I said, we're evolving and learning. And hopefully until the day that we die, we're continuing to open our eyes to something new. And I think there's a lot of power in trying a new sport or trying a new event 
and kind of being a beginner again, no matter what age you are, it, it really, it makes who you are as a person, um, just that much more complete. And, you know, I love that, you know, so many CTS athletes, you know, it's this whole spectrum from pros to beginners and all ages, because everybody is just kind of working on themselves as a little work in progress. Yeah. Oh man. I love that so much because I mean, yeah, I feel like every, every single, I mean, I, I coach athletes too, and you know, they're from all, all ranges of abilities, but again, it's like that one thing that you can throughout your whole life, the one relationship I means the relationship with yourself that you're constantly learning about and yeah. through every situation you can learn something more. And I think that that's, that's really powerful. Um, and I guess, I mean, we we've talked a little bit about how you kind of you've redefined yourself through sport. And I guess it's just, you know, how you've, you decided to change paths, like you said, from going from short bike racing to stage races to, you know, bike packing adventures. Um, and how, how would you say that it's important to kind of redefine yourself as an athlete? Does it, I mean, for you, it doesn't seem like it goes through basically, you know, through, winning a race although you know you've you've done that at every stage but still is it more about just pursuing what interests you what makes you passionate yeah I think that is super important I mean even as a little kid like in Chicago suburbs I had this curiosity you know to see what was on the next block or I wanted to camp out in the backyard and that really has guided me when I'm like, oh, I wonder what it would be like to do a 24-hour mountain bike race, or I wonder what it would be like, you know, to do this. And so listening to kind of that little voice that's like, hmm, I wonder, um, is I think really important. And people have, people have said to me, oh, like, how did you know when to pivot your career and, you know, stop doing Leadville and doing this other stuff? And it's really, I listen to myself, but it's also other people around me, you know, you know, when I was doing Leadville full on, Dean Golich was my coach and, you know, he was really great about even my weekly, weekly workouts. He, you know, we sort of had these free days where I could go, you know, backcountry skiing or hiking in the woods, because I think he knew that there was this little part of me that, that had to go exploring. And, mm -hmm. and that kind of, allowed me the freedom instead of saying, oh, I have to do intervals every day or I have to do this. Yeah. <laughs> there was a little bit of time in there for me to be that little kid who wanted to camp out in the backyard and play. Um, and so I think, you know, when people are pivoting, whether it's in their career or in a sport or moving somewhere else, um, it's important to listen to that little voice inside your head and if you can't always hear that little voice, then perhaps your coach or a friend or other people who invite you to do things like me getting invited to eco challenge and somebody's like, Hey, do you want to go try this? And, or Alaska. And my initial thought is hell no. <laughs> <laughs> but then I thought about it a little and it kept popping back into my head and Alaska kept popping back into my head. And I started like, like I said, I started like looking up movies like Balto and like kind of getting intrigued <laughs> and that was a message to myself that's like, hmm, there's something to this. Maybe I should, I should explore a little deeper and, and do a little more research. And ultimately that led to me going to the Iditarod Trail. So it's important to listen to that little tiny curiosity voice. Yeah, I know. I always, I always have that, but sometimes, sometimes, um, it's, sometimes it takes a little bit of an extra step because again, you're never gonna, at least I never will feel like I'm totally prepared. And it just kind of, just saying yes and then kind of fig having like people around you to kind of figure out things um to support you and help you kind of get there um <laughs> but I think another thing I kind of wanted to circle back to we kind of touched on it a little bit um this is a I was curious to to ask you this question in particular um just about women in sport in general I mean you definitely got into ultra endurance cycling and just sports in general. I mean, when, where women were kind of the minority, um, definitely in, 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 in adventure racing. I mean, still the, the construct of a team in an adventure race is, you know, you have one woman, um, to, you know, like a four person team or, you know, at least one woman present. Um, but getting into the sport, uh, do you, 
Did you have other women role models or was that even, was it even a factor in you getting into sport? Well, I was super lucky in, in, you know, in some ways in that I grew up in a female only household. You know, my dad was shot down in the Vietnam War when I was really young. And so he grew up with a single working mom, a sister, older sister, and it was really the three of us. And, you know, my mom became, you know, this high powered computer executive. My sister is a general in the Air Force now. And so our household growing up, there was never like, oh, girls don't do that. They're, you know, it's just, well, if something needed fixing, we got it done. Or, you know, I mowed the lawn as a kid. There were not these separation of traditional male, female roles in our household, um, which was great because it, I grew up thinking, well, yeah, anyone can do anything. And I've never thought of myself as a female in sport or a female firefighter or a female business owner. I'm just all of those things without the gender and, And I think a lot of that came from my upbringing and, and my very early, you know, my first running experience, uh, my first sports experience was on, you know, the cross country team, which was the girls cross country team. And so immediately I was thrown into a peer group of female athletes, you know, we had a male coach and a female coach. And so I was lucky at a very young age that I saw strong women and in my life. And that's what I have emulated, you know, fast forward to rock climbing and paddling and all those things and adventure racing. And yeah, I I definitely was the minority female, but I, you know, I had this confidence just from being a kid growing up and having to fend for myself, you know, um, my sister and I have to fend for ourselves a bunch that (laughs) we grew up pretty independent and pretty strong minded. And, Absolutely. I feel like it's so powerful to have female role models and we need them. And it's part of why I do podcasts like this or, you know, teach, you know, women's mountain bike groups, because it was really important for me to see somebody else who'd come before me. I mean, Lynn Hill was a really big climbing role model for me um, in mountain biking when I got involved in mountain biking. And you'll remember, I sucked really bad at mountain biking. Um, and Marla Streb was a really big role model for me. And so all along the way, you know, starting with my mom and my sister. Um, but I do think it's important that, that we share, you know, our experiences and what's really cool for me, what I love is when dads, you know, you know, will come and say, yeah, I told my daughter about you or, or, you know, I told my wife about you. And I think that that's great that, you know, I'm hopefully not just a role model for, for women, but also for anyone, you know, who's wanting to work hard. And I think when we really will have arrived somewhere is like I said, when you no longer consider somebody, Oh, she's, she's one of the best female athletes in the world, or she's one of the best, whatever you'll take out the gender qualification and just say, she's one of the best. And, or yeah. he's one of the best or, or whatever. And we're, and that we're, then we're judged on our ability and what we can do instead of, instead of our, you know, yeah. genetic makeup <laughs> or our gender. You know, I think one thing that's been really cool about yeah. me doing ultra endurance sports is, and especially cycling is that everybody's on the same playing field. You know, you don't have separate you might be scored separately in a race like Leadville, but you're all riding together. Mm-hmm. And that has been a really great showcase for me to, you know, finish top 20 at Leadville one of the years or to beat a whole bunch of guys. And then people are like, oh, you know, it's this instant <laughs> respect when you can put everybody on the same playing field. Then you do really see, especially in endurance sports, how, you know, the difference between men and women's performance, the longer it gets. Um you know, the smaller that difference is. Yeah. Oh man. That's all. That's something I love too. I mean, I was raised very, very similarly with, you know, my parents saying that, you know, that doesn't really matter about gender. It's just, you like these things, you, you know, you can do it. And I had an older sister and, you know, we, I basically took my first steps, you know, camping and I was out playing in the dirt and it was just no, it was really no, no issue about the gender. And so, but I think now, you know, being kind of in the the opposite role of, you know, then assuming kind of this position of of motivating and being an example for other people, I do think it's an important, you know, place to be to kind of show that, 
okay, like, yes, I am, I am an athlete. I'm an endurance athlete, just like, you know, my, my peers, men or women. And, um, I mean, I guess like you have a, a bunch of things going on and I wanted to ask you about your foundation kind of at the end of this, of, the, of this episode, but, um, I wanted to ask you about your race that you have, um, in your hometown, um, and kind of how you view that Do you, as like something giving back. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to be able to be able to be an athlete, but then also host an event and bring other people to compete and explore in an area that you call home. Yeah. Rebecca's private Idaho is my gravel event that I do. And we're going into year number eight now, um, Mm -hmm. which is, is kind of exciting. And, but I launched it for a few reasons. I launched it, um, one to support my local community and, you know, bring people here, provide jobs here. Um, everywhere I travel around the world, people would ask like Idaho, like Iowa, what, what is that like? And I'm like, it's the most beautiful place in the world. And so I wanted to share my backyard with people. Um, but I want to support my community and bike charities that I care about and yeah, absolutely give back. Um, and I felt like, you know, that was a platform that made a lot of sense for me and, and it checked a lot of boxes for me to be able to be a host and throw a big, amazing bike party in my hometown. Um, and also encourage other people to get off the beaten path a little bit and, and go exploring. And, you know, it's called Rebecca's private Idaho because it goes into very remote terrain, no cell phone coverage, you know, no homes and, you know, really just goes out into, um, you know, just out into the hills. And I feel like people need more of that in our world right now, a little bit of exploration. And you're seeing how people are moving to wanting to do a little more exploring on their bike. And I think it's part of the, the growth of gravel right now is people want to get off the pavement. They want to kind of for safety, but also I think for emotionally people want to explore and want to have a little bit of quiet time away from the screens and the digital and and so, yeah, I launched the event. It's been wildly successful. We were on the front end of this whole gravel wave, which I didn't really yeah. know was coming. Um, but it's it's been great. And, I, it, you know, it's the number one fundraiser I do each year for my Be Good Foundation. Um, and it helps support other nonprofits like People for Bikes and World Bicycle Relief with the goal really of using, you know, my foundation is about using the bike as a vehicle for healing and evolution and empowerment. Yeah. And so it's, it's been, I, you know, I, I'm almost as proud of, you know, seeing somebody else cross the finish line, like with a huge mm-hmm. smile on their face and they've ridden a hundred miles. That is just as satisfying for me as me winning Leadville or winning another big race. It really does feel like this collective win. Yeah. And I mean, I love that too, because, um, just in, in, in endurance race, I mean, it is this you're alone, you know, you're the one that has to get you, get yourself to the finish line. Mm -hmm. But in that, you know, exploration of, you know, solidarity and like loneliness, um, there's this community aspect that, you know, you can, that you can create as well. I mean, some of my best friends have been like my, my best friends, they've been made on the trails. You know, you can share a few miles or a rough patch of a race with someone, and then you feel like you're bound together forever. And I feel um, like even creating a race, I mean, it's almost like, you know, cultivating connection in a way. I, I, you're absolutely right on that. And, and yeah, you might be riding alone, but when you finish, there's this big group of people who all went through the same experience as you did. And they all were like, oh yeah, that hill or that headwind, or <laughs> that was super hard. And did you see that? So it's kind of this beautiful, you know, marrying of, of isolation and solitude and sort of moving meditation, being by yourself, but then you're also connected to this community via the trail. And I mean, it's exactly how I feel about the Iditarod trail, you know, very few yeah. people do it or finish, but we are all a hundred percent bonded by the experience. And even if I don't know the people who were before or after me, I could meet them and we're instantly bonded by sort of the fiber of this trail and and the shared experience. And that's what I think is so cool about rides or races or events where people do come together. Um, And even if you do it separately or on another day, everybody 
starts from, you know, a level of like, yeah, I know what that trail is like. I know what it's about. Um, and we need community. We all need that kind of a tribe and finding it in sport is, is really amazing because you're growing yourself. You know, like I said, the trail is a teacher for you to evolve personally, but then you're also making that important human connection with other people who, who kind of get where you're coming from. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they don't classify your, <laughs> your version of fun as crazy. They right. also think it's fun. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> The bus. <laughs> but I mean, was it important to you to, um, to create this event like Rebecca's Prev Idaho? I've, I, I love Idaho and it's your event is something I really want to prioritize and come out to. Um, but was it important for you to create this event close to your home? Yeah, I wanted to, to have it at home one, because I travel a lot and selfishly I'm like, I should do an event here instead of going and traveling to all these other places. Um, But I also, I live in Idaho because I'm in love with it. It's beautiful. It has a ton of public land. Um, And I, I, you know, I wanted to bring people here to to celebrate, you know, public land, doing good. It's kind of people, place, and purpose really are the, you know, the reasons behind private Idaho and, and wanting to bring people here and and showcase here. And also, you know, it's a super small town and I want to keep living here. And so if I can help support the restaurants and the community and, um, you know, provide jobs for people, that's really important to me too. And then I can continue to live in this beautiful place. So it's partially yeah. selfish, but also um, also about my community and the cycling community and also, you know, people who've never been to Idaho, um, showing them a little slice of this paradise. Uh, yeah. And I mean, I know whenever I go home to Colorado, I mean, there's still there's still places there that, you know, even in my hometown of Fort Collins or where I live in Boulder, I feel like I can still do a ton of exploration there. So it's also, it's really cool to, you know, to share that with other people and then, you know, kind of help motivate yourself to be like, okay, like I'm going to, I'm going to explore my home in a more kind of intimate way. Um, But this is all kind of, um, I watched your Ted talk for um, the navigating home. Uh Um, And it's something that I just, man, like just kind of rediscovering what it means to 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 call a place home mm-hmm. um I think it's a really complex a complex subject yeah. um but I mean you can kind of go into more detail about this but it's something that I really wanted to just talk to you a little bit about because um yeah navigating home I feel like as athletes especially you mentioned people you know you travel a lot um you almost have to go places to kind of to define what home is, to figure out what home is to you. And then, yeah, can you kind of like describe what that, what that was about? Yeah, I, you're definitely right in that, um, you know, traveling and going somewhere is expansive for us personally. We get to see another culture, another place. Um, we get to explore and adventure. And, but most of us, you know, the last place I called home before Idaho was, you know, the suburbs of Chicago that we talked about as a kid. Yeah. And yeah. since then I haven't, you know, I hadn't found a place that felt right, that felt like a fit. And I think it yeah. was a combination of um, me physically not finding the right place. But I also think it was a, um, a factor was me emotionally not being ready to accept a place or knowing myself. And really it was my ride down the Ho Chi Minh trail, which was five years ago, um, was a big expedition. I did a 1200 mile ride with really the, the goal of, of doing that ride, but finding the place where my dad's plane was shot down in the Vietnam war. And, you know, doing that adventure really was a pivotal moment in my entire life because it, when I, connected with my dad and got to know him through stories and through being in Vietnam and Laos. Um, but I also really got to know myself and understand what was important to me. And, you know, I think a lot of these races and the traveling I've been doing, I was always kind of onto the next thing, onto the next thing and, you know, chasing all these goals without really understanding why or understanding my motivation 
And that ride on the Ho Chi Minh Trail and the subsequent years that followed, you know, required me to do a lot of soul searching and think about, you know, what am I doing all this for? And to really answer some super hard personal questions that I had never taken the time um, to explore. And I'll be honest with you, the, the two years after coming home from doing that ride were a pretty dark time for me because I wondered, you know, have I lost my competitive edge? Like, how do you follow up on the most important ride you've done in your life? And what does all that mean? And I spent a lot of time soul searching and journaling and writing things down and talking to friends. And that ride really did help me discover my purpose and launch the foundation and really motivated me for the rides I've been doing now that are more expedition based, that are more exploratory and um, where I can challenge myself and and learn myself, but also share that with other people and have a giving back aspect and a be good aspect to everything I'm doing. And so that ride really is, I felt like I found my home in my heart and my soul, but I also found my purpose and, and the physical place I wanted to be, which was Idaho and, you know, bonded more with my husband. And so it really was a sense of home is, Yes, it's physical, but it's also emotional inside you. And, you know, for anybody who hasn't sat down and written down their own personal mission statement or their own core values that they live by, you know, I I would encourage you to do so because what that's done for me, um, that sort of introspection is it's given me guidelines of how I want to live the rest of my life. And, you know, just like in business, you know, every business has a mission statement and core values, but very few people actually do that for themselves. And so that has been, that is how I've found my sense of home is really by um, going inside and answering some tough questions. Oh man. And uh, I was just so, I was just so touched when I watched that, when I watched your Ted talk and, Um, and then subsequently I encourage everyone to kind of go out and, and watch Blood Road. This was the, the, basically the documentary of you going and, you know, finding where your father's plane was shot down on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's just that, that sense of finding home. But then at the end of the day, it's like really looking inward. And I feel like maybe you have to go, you did go to a really extreme place to do that. Um, but I think it's, it's something that, And correct me if I'm wrong, like, do you get to kind of re-experience that? Like every time you have, you know, a tough endurance race or, you know, an adventure that you have planned? You know, I, that was a really like the opening of, you know, opening of a door for me. And that, that experience Mm -hmm. was really powerful learning experience for me, but you're exactly right. It's why I'm moving to these longer expedition rides because, I absolutely feel like the trail is my teacher and, you know, I go out on these long things and these journeys to learn and the lesson is different every time. Um, but it, this is where I evolve and learn and meditate is out on these really, really long rides. And so something like the Iditarod trail is essential for me to continue to grow and learn and, and find out more about myself. But absolutely, after a cold race like that, I want to come home and have a nice warm shower. (laughs) And, you know, it really is a balance between comfort and discomfort. And, you know, there's this quote that I really love by Viktor Frankl that says, what is to give light must endure burning. And it Mm. talk, you know, it kind of points out that, you know, you need to do hard, painful, suffering things um, to really kind of see your light or shine your light. And, you know, sports are a small example of that um, and a way that we can actually learn about ourselves um, in a palatable, you know, um, easier way than having to go through a war or, you know, do something, you know, unchosen. So, I mean, sports are such a great way to work really hard and to put ourselves through um, an uncomfortable situation so that you finish that mm-hmm. long ride or that long run or, and, and you're, you're a little bit of a different person than when you set out. Yeah. 
And even though, I mean, it seems like sports can, you know, they are a solitary kind of experience, um, even though you can experience them with other people. Um, I think it's so great just that you've, I mean, even last, last year you, um, officially, um, started your foundation, the Be Good Foundation as a way to kind of, you know, give back and to create, um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the Be Good Foundation and the idea from it came from my ride down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And Be Good are the the words my dad my dad signed his letters home from the Vietnam War. So that's how he signed off, and it's kind of become you know a bit of my mission statement. And hmm. I I definitely feel like he asked you know he brought me there to show me you know what I could do with my bike. And and really the impetus for the foundation came from seeing all the unexploded ordnance that still exists along the Ho Chi Minh Trail and a war that ended 50 years ago is still killing people because the bombs are still there and they haven't exploded. And so the the impetus for the foundation was to use my bike to help clean up the bombs along the Ho Chi Minh Trail in my dad's name. And the, the foundation's mission has grown to, you know, the mission statement is using the bike as a vehicle um, or catalyst for healing, empowerment, and evolution. And so, you know, some of my projects like MTB Lao, where I take a group back to the Ho Chi Minh Trail, um, specifically goes towards clearing bombs along the trail. Private Idaho, for example, is all about getting bikes in the people's hands who need them, like World Bicycle Relief that provides bikes for healthcare workers and students in Africa, or People for Bikes that work yeah. on bike infrastructure, um, or our, our local Idaho Cycling League. And so the foundation, you know, thanks to my dad, really has given me purpose to my riding. And it's it's been such a cool evolution of my career because suddenly now, you know, all these trophies and these things I have, which are great, you know, sitting on my, you know, shelf in my house. Um, <laughs> and they're nice to look at and they're great memories and I'm really proud of them, but they're actually this launching pad that are that is allowing me to, you know, maybe inspire the next world champion or, you know, somebody in Africa who, you know, wants to get to school and study to be a doctor. And so suddenly, you know, my individual trophies have taken on a much bigger meaning through the foundation. And it's pretty cool. It's pretty exciting. Uh, I love that because I mean, yeah, races and trophies. Yeah. They are great memories, but it's like, as soon as they're, they're done, I mean, they're over. Like there's nothing to really hold on to. And so I love this, the, the foundation of basically bringing something that's tangible, um, and doing that through endurance sports and and cycling, I think is, is, is just incredible. I think Um, it's like when people get a master's degree or they become a doctor or they get an education, you know, then they go to, they go on to use it for something else. And that's how Mm -hmm. I look at my sport and, you know, my trophies and those things is, they're meant to be used for giving mm-hmm. something else to somebody. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not done racing or chasing trophies, but you know, <laughs> my mission statement includes, you know, challenging myself, but also challenging others to be good. I love that. Um, and so, oh man, thank you so much, Rebecca. <laughs> I, I wanted to end, um, we've talked about so many things, but I just wanted to end with, um, just one question, just to ask you. Uh, so, what what gets you up like each morning? Um, you know, excited to train and and keep dreaming and pushing yourself through. You know, all of your changes in careers, and you know, you're not stopping anytime soon. Um, but what is it that kind of keeps you motivated every day to kind of keep keep exploring? Well, I will say I'm not motivated every day. And so we can break the myth (laughs) that professional athletes are continually motivated and it is hard and we do need to rely on help and coaches and other people. Um, Honestly, you know, when you set, when you ask that question, what really gets me up every single day is my dog, (laughs) dogs, (laughs) um, coming to the edge of the bed, wagging their tails, being so excited that like, it's a new day. And so I really do try to take motivation and lessons from my dogs. You know, they wake up happy. They want to run outside. You know, they take lots (laughs) of naps. Like, so whenever I'm in doubt, it's like, what would Diesel do? What would my dog do? And 
really having an appreciation that we're alive and we get to do this and how lucky we are, you know, to be able to run in the mountains or play outside um, or take a nap. And so, yeah, I, I sort of, what would Diesel do is always when I'm lacking motivation. <laughs> I love that honesty because yeah, I definitely don't feel motivated every day either. I guess it's like the, the bigger, grander scheme of things. I need to, I need to get a dog. Cause you're right. They're, they're always so excited to go outside and I'm like, what is totally. going on? <laughs> totally. And like Diesel has never, and Gracie, they've never caught a squirrel but yet every time they see one, they chase it with like this abandon and this motivation of like, you know, they don't think, oh, I suck. I'm never going to get a squirrel. You know, they just go after it. And so I, I try to be that way when I'm going after stuff. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is so amazing. This is so amazing because, uh, yeah, my, my parents have a German short-haired pointer and he's the same way. But actually, this dog has actually caught a squirrel. So he's like, uber motivated to catch another one. Oh yeah that's <laughs> awesome <laughs> we can all learn oh, from that kind of motivation yeah. you know yeah we can <laughs> well I love that so what would diesel do I'll, I'll think I'll think of your dogs with that okay. but um <laughs> I guess <laughs> I digress but thank you so much for for everything for talking with us today I feel like you know we can we can learn an immense amount um from just this conversation, but then also just from kind of the, you know, self-exploration and, you know, not being afraid to, to go to those deep, dark places and, you know, learning to, to trust yourself, to find a way, to find a way through. Well, and when you have your mission statement, your personal mission statement, um, feel free to share it with me. That's my challenge to you. Oh, okay. I love that. I definitely will. <laughs> But thanks so much to, for talking with us today, Rebecca. Thank you. That was really fun. Be good.